Hi, April. Hi. How are you? Well, I've had better days. Had a rough week. I'm sorry. I, uh, my cat got sick, has been sick for a while, and got bad last week, and yesterday I had to have him put down, so. Sad. I'm sorry, that's an awful, that's an awful feeling. Yeah. I've had to do that once, and it wasn't fun. You know, 2020 sucks. I'm just, <laughs> I'm ready for this year to be over with. Hey, April, did you get my email? I did not check email last week, so okay. let me look. How long ago did you send it? I think it was like Thursday. Oh, yep, yeah, there it is. James Cooper. Okay, I'll, uh, after class, I'll respond to that. No problem. Thank you. Let's see. Go down here and here. Did you guys enjoy your break last week? Anybody do anything exciting? <laughs> All right, well, it is 4.01, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, we're covering 4.5 today, and basically there's one objective, <laughs> and it's solving inequalities that involve a quadratic function. Short, sweet, and to the point. Um, so anyway, Okay, so um, if they give you this up here and they ask you to solve that, all right, you're actually solving that equation or inequality equation. And basically what you need to know is where does it cross the x-axis? Now this PowerPoint goes through a lot of extra steps like they, they find the vertex and they find the y-intercept, but you really don't need to know that. What you need to know is where it crosses the x-axis and is it a smiley face or is it a frowny face? And of course that depends on, you know, your coefficient right here, your a. If A is greater than zero, you get the smiley face. And if A is less than zero, you get the frowny face. And then you need to know where it crosses the X axis. And the thing about that is your, um, whenever you cross the X axis, your Y coordinates are always zero. And that's what they have right here. They already have it set equal to zero. So all you have to do is factor this thing. 
So if I were to factor it, I would get x and x, that's for the x squared, and then I need two factors of negative 12 that will add up to the negative four. So that would be a negative six and a positive two. And then that is where it actually equals zero. That's the equal to part right there. So X, this X right here would have to be a six, which is what you see right there. This point right here is at six, zero. And this X would have to e equal a negative two, which is what they're showing right here. This is crossing at negative two. Now, I know it's a smiley face, so I've got a smiley face. Here's my x-axis. It crosses here at negative two and here at positive six. And now what we want to do is look at the less than part. We wanna know where is this graph less than zero? So I'm now gonna look at less than zero and all of the points that have a y coordinate that is less than zero, here's my y-axis, every one of these points down here on the bottom part of that parabola, any point in between there has a y-coordinate that is less than zero. I'm just pointing at each one of these points. I'm pointing at their y-coordinate. All of this is where the y-axis is negative, right? Is less than zero, which means, uh, I'm gonna need a different color here, uh, we'll go with green. That means that all of the x-coordinates in between the negative two and the six, those are all the x's that would give you a y that's less than zero. And that's what they're trying to show you down here on the, on the number line graph, or this is really just the x-axis is what they're doing. And they've highlighted it here. They used blue, but it's kind of hard to see, so I'm highlighting it in green. But that's what they're showing, you know, right? That's what I'm trying to show right here, is every point in between negative two and six would have y-coordinates that are less than zero. That's how I can do this visually. Now, if you wanted to check one of those points, just pick any X coordinate between uh, negative two and six and plug it in to your equation and see if it comes out to be less than or equal to zero. And the easiest one to pick would be zero. <laughs> so if I took zero and I plugged it in for this X here and this X here, I would get zero minus zero minus 12. And minus 12, is that less than or equal to zero? Yes, it is. So I've, I found the right interval. Okay, so they went and did an example where they said, solve this, in in, this inequality. And they gave two methods for solving it. The first method was set it equal to zero. So that's what they did. It says option one, rearrange the inequality so that a zero is on the right side, which is what I showed you previously. And then they went on to find the y-intercepts and the, the vertex, I think, but you really need just the x-intercepts. So they took the x squared minus x minus 10, set it equal to zero, they factored it, and then they set each individual factor set equal to zero. So either the two x minus five was your zero or the x plus two was your zero, and then they solved them. And those are the x-intercepts, negative two and five halves. And then for some reason they went on to find the vertex and all of this, but if you look at the picture here, here they are, here is the negative two zero, here is the five halves zero, 
And we, sorry, I gotta go back. What was the inequality? When you set it equal to zero, we had a less than sign. So we wanna know where is the parabola less than zero? So coming back here, the parabola is less than zero below the x-axis, it's right here. So this is just like that last one, anything in between here, anything in between is where our parabola is less than zero. So, and there was no equal to, so we're going from this point to this point and anything in between, which would be from the negative two up to the five halves. Um, actually, I guess I should have put open circles on those because it didn't say equal to, it just said less than. Now, if I go back one slide, they actually say this in their written explanation. Um, the graph is below the x-axis, when is the function less than zero, between negative two and five halves. And then they gave it an interval notation right here like I did, negative two comma five halves. Um, this was in set builder notation, but I've already gone over all the homework and every answer they want in um, interval notation. So they were just going over that. Now that was the first method where you set it equal to zero and that's probably the method I'm gonna use the most, but they do come up with an option number two Option two is you don't set it equal to zero. You basically, <laughs> they basically took the left side of the equation and called the two X, we're just gonna call the two X squared F of X. And then they went over to the right side where the X plus 10 was and they called that G of X. And the original function did say um, 2x squared is less than x plus 10. So they're just leaving it that way. Here's the x plus 10. They just call that g of x, which is right here. And then on the left side, they called that 2x squared uh, an f of x, which is right here. And we are looking for where? the pink is less than the green. So on this method, you'd actually have to graph both of them. So now you're dealing with two graphs and that's kind of a pain in the butt in my opinion. So they show all the work here, but here's the graph when they get done. <laughs> um, let's see, the, this is the parabola. And then the other function was linear. And then what you do is you look at where those two graphs intersect here and here. And if you notice the X intercept, the X coordinate of that intersection point is negative two. And this one over here is also, well, you can see it right there, five halves the negative two and the five halves. And it's everything in between because now you're looking at where is the pink less than the green? Isn't that what I said earlier? Yeah, where is the pink less than the green? So when I look at this picture, the pink is below the green all in here. All of this pink is below that green line. Now, if I look above the green line, this would be greater than here and this would be greater than there. If they had said greater than, I'd be looking at those two intervals instead. So I personally like option number one and that's the option I'm gonna use um, unless they force me to look at this. Um, that's what I'm gonna do if that's okay with you guys. Cause I'd rather just graph I just want to find the x-intercepts and then know, is it a smiley face or a frowny face? And then either look below the x-axis or above the x-axis. That's much easier than 
graphing two different functions. One's a parabola, the other one's linear. Then I got to remember all that crap. I'm like, man. So option one. Um, and then here's another example, which is very similar to the other one. Solve this inequality, except this one has a greater than. They want to know where is the parabola greater than zero? Um, oh, this one doesn't factor. Ugh. I'm pretty sure all the ones that worked for you guys factored pretty much. There was only one I ran into an inequality or a, a radical on. Um, well, Oh, 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 that's right. Okay, so this one didn't factor. Um, so they, they didn't even bother using the quadratic formula, I don't think. They wanted to determine using the discriminant whether it crosses the x-axis in two places, one places, or no places. So when they did the discriminant, da, 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 da. It says graph the function, the y-intercept is one. Remember, c is your one. And then there are no x-intercepts. Do you see why? Check the discriminant. Remember, your discriminant is the b squared minus 4ac. And b was... B was this invisible one right here, so it'd be a one there. And A was this one right here. And C, I highlighted. So you'd end up with one squared is one minus four times one times one is four, and that gives you negative three. So you'd have a negative three underneath the radical, and that's imaginary. So that tells me that I have a parabola. Let's see, a, my a was greater than zero, it was a positive one. So this sucker's smiling at me. But since there are no x-intercepts, I have a floater. It's floating above the x-axis here. So when they ask me, which inequality was it? greater than zero, um, they want to know where is this parabola greater than zero? Meaning, where is it above the x-axis? The whole damn thing, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Every single x-coordinate on that parabola has a y-coordinate that's greater than zero. So that's how the answer came out to be negative infinity to positive infinity. And then they show the picture right here and you can see it, it's a floater. But the whole thing from left to right, every single point, it doesn't matter what point I'm looking at, these are all the X coordinates, right? These are all its X coordinates. And then each one of those has a Y coordinate that is above the X axis all of them. So that's the basic of this. And I'm now going to do a bunch of examples through my math lab, unless you guys got any questions at the moment. All right. Well, here's number one. It says, just use the graph of the quadratic function. They didn't give you a formula, you know, an equation or anything. They just graphed it for you. Uh, two parts, A and B. So for part A, I am looking for where the function is greater than zero. That would be, where is the parabola above the x-axis? It is above the x-axis here and here. Now it does say greater than, it does not have the equal to on it. The next part has the equal to on it. This here, 
where is the function less than or equal to? That would be the part of the parabola that is below the x-axis, okay? So the way you interpret this is simply um, all of these, this where I highlighted yellow, mm, this goes this way. It keeps going up. It's everything to the left here. And this here also, everything to the right, okay? The purple is everything in between. I'm kind of highlighting my x-axis for you here. Here's the x-axis, here's the x-axis. So if I were to translate to just the x-axis, um, my intersection points are, this one's negative six, so here's negative six, and this one intersects at five, okay? Um, so the yellow part goes from negative infinity up to the negative six, but doesn't include it. And then on the other side from five to infinity. The purple part includes the negative six and includes the five in between. So the answer to part A, they want greater than, that was the yellow stuff. So A is the yellow stuff and that's gonna be inside here it goes from negative infinity up to the negative six, and then you're gonna have to click on the union symbol. Um, as soon as you click on that box, a little toolbox in the bottom of my math lab pops up and you'll be able to find infinity there and then this um, union symbol. And then on the other side, it picks up at the five and continues on to infinity. And then part B will pop up and it'll say the solution to f of x is less than zero. They'll be looking for f of x is less than zero and then they'll have a box for that. And for that one in there, you'll put the purple, but it is an equal to. Because of the equal to, you have to remember to use brackets. So it's going to be everything in between the negative six and the positive five. And those are your answers. Hmm. I was trying to keep with some, you know, Halloween colors for you since Halloween's coming up, you know, a little purple, orange, black, green, you know, a little yellow. Questions on that? All right, now the next one, they actually give me um, option number two, where they graph the two pictures and it's a little tougher, but they've got them in red and blue. So they've got um, red and I have to go with that color blue. I don't have a, wait a minute, more colors. Can I find wildcat blue? There we go, I found it. All right, so when I look over here, G of X, I can see from the picture, G of X is red. And F of X is in blue. So for part A, you are looking for where g of x, which is red, is greater than f of x. So where in this graph is the red greater than or equal to the blue? So if you look at the picture, and they've got such a... a, a skinny parabola. It makes more sense when I make my parabola kind of like this and then draw this line. Well, no, this isn't working. Yeah, it does. Draw this line more like this. Okay. 
if you if you look at this graph from left to right, I don't know if you can see my hand or not, from left to right, as you go along, let's say that I've got my x-axis down here just so it's away from it. As you're going along, if you're at this x-coordinate, whatever it is, this point on the red graph has that x-coordinate, and this point on the blue graph also has that same x coordinate. If you go over and then look, let me, let's see. Okay, so these two points have the exact same x coordinate, right? But when you go over and look at their y coordinates, this one has a y coordinate here and this one has a y coordinate there. Isn't the higher up you go on the y axis, doesn't it give you larger numbers? So I can see that this point has a larger y coordinate than this one does, right? This point, which was on the blue, has a larger y coordinate than this point, which was on the red. So I can see that blue is greater than red right there, which is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for where red is greater than blue. So from, go back to my highlighter. Everywhere from here to here, if I compare the graph, the red graph, that red line is always above the blue curve in between there. But when I go over and look at it to the left, everywhere where in between here, the blue graph is above the red graph. Same thing over here from this point to the right. You can see the blue graph is always above the red graph. That means the points on the blue graph have greater y coordinates than the points on the red graph. So where I highlighted in blue, where I highlighted in blue, that would actually be where g of x is less than or equal to f of x. That's the difference. So in my, their actual graph over here, from here to here, all of this, that is where the red graph is greater than the blue graph. And you just have to look where they intersect. Um, let me go with green because I can see green real well. They intersect here, which has an X coordinate of zero and here, which has an X coordinate of six. So in between zero and six, that's my answer. And because they had an equal to on that, I need brackets. So it's going to be in between zero and six. All right, and then, oh, well, <laughs> instead of writing it like this, they flipped it around and put, they put the f of x first. Well, that was cruel. They put f, where is f of x? greater than g of x. All right, so here's the blue. They switched it around. Where is the blue above the red? Which is the same thing as saying the red below the blue, whatever. So that would be all the way to the left and all the way to the right. So for that, I still need the zero and the six, except you're going from negative infinity up to that first intersection point. And then you jump over to the other intersection point and go from there to infinity. 
So this one's gonna be negative infinity up to the zero, but don't include it, unioned with the six to infinity. And you can see that they're using um, the same numbers. Mm, go to orange, I guess. Uh, this zero right here, that's the same zero as this one. And this six right here, that's the same six as this one. Sometimes it looks better when I draw it on a number line. If you just look at the X axis, and here is zero and here is six, um, from negative infinity up to zero, and from six to infinity the other direction, that is the blue stuff. And then in between, you've got the yellow stuff. There's there's three intervals here. The x-axis goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, we all know that. But when I'm looking at where these two graphs intersect, um, they intersected here, which is at the, well, my picture's not perfect, sorry. <laughs> it's over on this one, I already did it in green. Pretend like the, the y-axis, x-axis isn't there. And then this intersection, or y-axis, and then this one was six. Do you see it now? I've, I've tried to, <laughs> I tried to make these, you know, right here. So you can see them. Blue, yellow, blue. Negative infinity to zero, zero to six, six to infinity. There's three intersections there. Where the blue is, my highlighter of blue, your f of x function is always above the g of x function. But where the yellow is in between, the g of x function is above the f of x function. <sighs> I'm hoping the color makes it more clear. I learned this with chalk on a chalkboard, so. All right, so that was number two. Number three, now number three just gives you the inequality. They don't draw a picture for you at all. It just says solve it. This one already has zero on the right side. So all I'm gonna do is factor this. And what I'm, what I'm factoring, I'm actually looking for where it crosses the x-axis. So this is x and this is x. And then I need two factors of negative eight that will add up to negative two. So a positive two and a negative four. And so this X right here would have to be a negative two. And this X right here would have to be a positive four. So um, A, my a is equal to a one. Since a is greater than zero, I know I've got a smiley face parabola, right? So here's the x-axis. I have a smiley face parabola, which crosses the x-axis at negative two and positive four. Keep in mind, this is my x-axis. I really don't need to know what the vertex is. I know it's below the x-axis. And now we take into consideration the inequality. And they're giving me an inequality of less than zero. So if we want less than zero, we want below the x-axis. Below the x-axis is this part of the parabola, which is in between negative two and four and there is not an equal to, so I just use parentheses. So negative two to four. That's my answer. Choice A, negative two to four. 
Uh, if you hear that water, it's a, it's a kitty fountain and my daughter got a kitten a couple of weeks ago. Strange timing with the death of my other cat, but anyway, he's playing with the water over there, if you can hear that. It's a cute little thing. He's one of those tuxedo cats. All right, solve this inequality. Um, now this one is not set equal to zero, so the first thing I'm gonna do is subtract 12 from both sides. So that's gonna give me x squared minus x minus 12 is greater than zero. I'm just gonna unfoil it. x and x, I need two factors of negative 12 that'll add up to a negative one. Mm. Positive three and a negative four. Positive three times negative four multiplies to be negative 12, but adds up to negative one. So there we go. Which means that this x intercept right here would have to be a negative three because negative three plus three would make that zero. And this x would have to be a positive four. Okay, so here's my x axis, right? It's going to cross at negative three and positive four. And I know that when I look up here, a, a was equal to a one, a is greater than zero. That means it's a smiley face. So it's doing this, okay? And now we're looking for where is this thing greater than zero? Greater than zero. Greater than zero means above. Switch to a purple pen. We're looking for above the x axis. And above the x axis would be here and here, right? Those intervals actually go this way. They go from negative infinity up to the negative three, and then from four, going this way, four to infinity, and there is no equal to sign, no equal to sign, so my answer is gonna be negative infinity up to negative three, but don't include it, union with from four to infinity. That's my answer. It goes right there. Okay. Now they're going to make it a little bit more complicated. Okay. Well, just me and my algebra skills. We are gonna start by distributing the three to get rid of the um, parentheses. So that's gonna be three X squared minus one is greater than the negative eight X. And then I am going to add eight X to both sides. And there is no like term in there. So I'll have the three X squared first. I'll have the plus eight X in the middle, and then the minus one, and now it's greater than zero. <clears throat> and then um, I'm going to, you can either factor or use the quadratic formula. Oh, I'm sorry, I made a boo-boo. When I distributed that three, uh, three times one is three. There we go. So I was going, this isn't gonna factor. And then I looked down at my notes and I was like, oops, sorry. All right. Um, I can actually factor this using the AC method. 
The AC method is when you take the A and you multiply it times the C and three times negative three is negative nine. So I need two factors of negative nine to replace the positive eight with, and that would have to be negative one times a positive nine. So I'm going to rewrite this as 3x squared minus 1x plus 9x minus 3. And then I'll factor by grouping. I will put the first two together and the second two together. From the first two, I will factor out just an x. And follow me because I've run out of room. When I pull out an x, I'll be left with a 3x minus 1. And then from the last two, 9x minus 3, I can pull out a positive 3 from those, which will also leave me with a 3x minus 1. So you can now see that they have a matching factor of 3x minus 1. And then the other factor, you just put together the x and the plus 3. That goes here and here. And now I need my two x-intercepts. This one's easy. This would have to be a negative 3. This one, since it's a minus 1, I would need a positive 1. And then to get rid of the 3 from the 3x, you would divide by 3. So here's my x-axis. It is going to cross, the parabola will cross at the negative 3 here and the 1 third there. And then let's see, I need to look at, I'm going to cut, this part right here is where I need to focus. It's where you set it equal to zero. Since my, my A is a positive three, I know it's going to be a smiley face, right? So this thing is going to come down and curve and go back up again. But to figure out where it's curving, I need to look at the part that says greater than or equal to Greater than or equal to zero means you're looking for above x-axis. Okay, that didn't write very well. <laughs> We're looking for above x-axis. And that would be here. In here, this is very, this is similar to the last one. Yep. So my intervals go from negative infinity up to that negative three. And then on the other side, from one third to infinity in that direction. So negative infinity to negative three unioned with one third to infinity. And again, there's no equal to, so don't use a bracket. Now, had that been a less than sign, then it would have been just one interval in between negative three and one third. And Excuse if me. either of those had an equal to on it, I would have had to put brackets. Was there a question? Yeah, can you go over how, we, how can you go over how you factored that again? Yes. I use that thing called the AC method <clears throat> where you take A, which is three times negative three, which multiplies to give me negative nine. And then your factors are either one times nine or three times three. Those are the only factors. You need the pair that will add up to a positive eight X in the middle. And since it was a negative nine here, I know one's got to be positive and the other has got to be negative. So I would need a negative one and a positive nine to replace that eight X. And that's what I did down here. 
I took the middle term out and replaced it with a negative 1x plus a 9x. It, you're actually putting back what outsides and insides are from the FOIL method. Because like when you multiply, you get first, outside, inside, last, and then you usually combine outsides and insides to get a middle term. Well, this method takes the middle term and puts back outsides and insides so you can factor by what they call grouping. Then I put them in groups of two. I had the first two here, the three X squared minus one X. That's this, and I factored out just an X. And then I had the second pair, nine X minus three, and I factored out a three from them. And when you do that, your parentheses should match. If they don't match, you're either not factoring correctly or you picked the wrong pair <clears throat> when you replace the middle term. And then when the two match, that's your first factor. It's the three X minus one. That's the matching factor. And then you just take the X and the plus three, which were the two things you foiled out or factored out and they basically come together and become the second factor. Is that better? Yeah. I got so much color on here. Are you understanding the uh, graph part, like how to figure out the intervals? Yes. All right, now when I get to number 10, oh, 10 has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parts to it. So I uh, made pretty much, well, I think six slides, but <clears throat> so number 10 says, use the functions f of x is equal to x squared minus one and g of x is equal to five x plus five to answer parts a through g. So unfortunately, this is an option two kind of a problem because they're writing the two functions separately and they're forcing me to do it all. So, erg. All right, so we're gonna start with part A and it says solve f of x equal to zero. So I'm gonna come up here and f of x is x squared minus one. So I'm gonna take my x squared minus one, that is f of x, and set it equal to zero. Now there's two ways you can solve this. You can factor it, or since it's a quadratic and your bx guy is missing, you could solve it by taking square roots. But since it's already set equal to zero, and I know this is a difference of two squares, I'm just gonna factor it to be x plus one and x minus one. And this x right here would have to be a negative one. And this x right here would have to be a positive one. And it says the solution set is, and they have already put braces right here for you. So don't put a second set of braces. Just inside, you're going to type in inside here the one, or sorry, negative one, comma, positive one. Now, just for the heck of it, if you wanted to solve it taking square roots, first thing you'd have to do is add one to both sides to get the x squared by itself, and zero plus one is one. And then you're going to square root both sides. The square root cancels out the squared, leaving me with an X. But then you have to remember that when you square root the one, it's gonna give you either a positive or a negative one. So you have to remember that part. When you factor, you can see the two factors. If you use the square root method, you have to remember, oh yeah, there's two possible answers, positive and negative. So anyway, all right. So then we go to part B. 
And part B says solve g of x is equal to zero. And g of x is a 5x plus 5. So set that equal to zero. Um, I will subtract 5 on both sides. Cancels that out. I get 5x is equal to negative 5. And then I'm going to take my 5x and divide it by 5. And of course, what you do to one side, you got to do to the other. So those cancel. And on this one, I get just one answer. X is negative 1, which it should be because 5x plus 5, that's linear. X is to the first power. There should just be one answer for x. It is negative 1. All you have to do is put the negative 1 inside there. <clears throat> All right, so then we get to part C. C says solve f of x equal to g of x. Okay, so f of x was the x squared minus 1. g of x was the 5x plus 5. So take the x squared minus 1. Set that equal to the 5x plus 5. And of course, that's a quadratic equation. <clears throat> so to solve it, I need to set it equal to 0 and then either factor it or use a quadratic formula, whatever floats your boat. Um, I am going to subtract the 5x from both sides. So that cancels, but in the same breath, I'm also going to subtract this 5, so that cancels. And I'm going to end up with the x squared, the minus 5x, he has nobody to connect with, but these two are like terms, so negative 1 and negative 5 is negative 6. And this one factor, so I'm just going to factor it. For the x squared, it's x and x. And then I need two factors of the negative 6 that add up to negative 5. So that would be negative 6 and positive 1. And now I can see that my two answers are for this one here, x is going to be positive 6, and this one here, x is negative 1. So inside this box here, you'll just type 6 comma negative 1. Or negative 1, 6 if you want to put them in numerical order. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. Sorry, I was trying to grab the kittens so I could show you. <laughs> he is full of energy. All right, number D, <laughs> letter D. All right, now this says solve f of x is greater than zero. Okay, <clears throat> well, back on part, oh, where was it? Part A we found where f of x equals zero and it equaled zero at negative one and positive one so if i want to know where f of x which is this x squared minus one where is that greater than zero okay this is a parabola and i found that when it was equal to zero it crossed at negative one and positive one. And because it is a 
positive one x squared. That's a smiley face. So when they want to know where is that greater than zero, it's greater than zero above the x-axis in those two spots. So off the x-axis, I'm going from negative infinity up to the negative one. And then I'm jumping over on the other side from one to infinity. That's my answer. Negative infinity up to negative one unioned with one to infinity. That is what I highlighted in purple. That's my answer that goes right there. Choice A. <clears throat> And then part E says solve G of X. <clears throat> G of X is less than zero. Well, when we solved G of X was equal to zero, we got X equaled negative one. Now this one's just a line, all right? So here's the X axis. This line is going to cross the X axis at negative one. Um, it's going to look something like that. It's a positive slope. So they want to know where is this graph less than or equal to zero. So we're looking at below the x-axis. It's less, remember the x-axis is where zero is for every point on it. All of them that are less than zero would be down here. And that would be going this way. So my answer on this one would be from negative infinity up to that negative one, but this time it has an equal to on it. And an equal to, you need a bracket. So that's what goes in here. <clears throat> Y'all with me? Your silence is very reassuring. <laughs> that was from Monsters, Inc. If you don't remember that. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And then part F. All right. Now F wants to know where is f of x greater than g of x? Okay, so now this would be from part c. C is where they want us, where they wanted us to find where f of x equals g of x. That is where they intersect each other. And those two numbers were six and negative one. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick sketch for you. F of X was the parabola, right? So that looks like this. G of X was the line, which looks something like that. Now I'm not drawing the X axis. What I'm gonna do is label the intersection points. When we found f of x equal to g of x, that's where they intersect here and here. This was, oh, negative one. This was negative one and this was six, okay? What we want to know is, where is the red graph greater than the blue one? Or red above blue is what I'm looking for. Red above blue. Red is above blue here and red is above blue there. 
the curvy part of the parabola is actually below the blue line. So as far as this is concerned, it's over here. You're going from negative infinity up to that green dot of negative one. And then on the other side, you're going this way from six to infinity in the other direction. So that's my answers. I'm going from negative infinity up to the negative one and then I stop because between negative one and six, that's all below. Between negative one and six, that's all this part. This would be <clears throat> where I highlighted in purple, this would be where f of x is less than g of x. <coughs> All right, I want the green stuff. So unioned with six to infinity. This is my answer that goes in this box. I mean, somebody else, it might generate a less than sign for you. It's got a greater than sign for me, but I suppose it could generate a less than sign for you. And if it had a less than sign, then my answer would have been from negative one to six. And then if there were equal twos on that, you would need some brackets instead of parentheses on the negative ones and sixes. So got to pay attention to that also. So, you know, get your highlighters out. And then one more 24 or one last part to number 10. And then I just got one more slide. Uh, this time says solve f of x greater than or equal to a one. Oh man, it is, that's a plot twist. Okay. F of X was my red function, which was the X squared minus one. And they want us to find where that is greater than or equal to one. So I have to put greater than or equal to a one right here. And solve for X. Uh, Okay, well, I'm just going to use the square root method on this one. I'm going to add one to both sides. So that cancels. And I get x squared is greater than or equal to one plus one is two. <clears throat> and so now to solve for x, I will square root it. But that means I got a square root on the other side. And the square root of x squared is just x. And the square root of two, I can't take the square root of two. Let's see. Type your answer in interval notation. Simplify your answer. Type an exact answer using radicals as needed. So it's plus or minus the square root of two. Okay, um, but I need to figure out where that goes on the graph. Um, okay. All right, so here's my x axis. I'm going to need my y axis on this one, I think. When you say x is greater than or equal to zero, that's on the zero axis, but we were doing greater than or equal to one. So here is one. We're looking at that. And then x squared minus one actually crossed. Let's see. What is the square root of two? It's one point something. This actually crossed at negative one and positive one. When we, when we drew the parabola before, it looks something like this, right? But we were looking for where it is below the x-axis. What we're looking for is where it is below 
or sorry, greater than the x-axis because it's a greater than or equal to. If that had said greater than or equal to zero, we would be looking above the x-axis. But this says greater than or equal to one. So we're actually looking for greater than or equal to above the line, that green line. The green line is the horizontal line of y is equal to one. We want above that. So we're looking for all of this. And this point right here and this point right here, that is the negative square root of two and positive square root of two. It's the exact same concept, except you're not dealing with zero, you're dealing with one, <laughs> that line. But I can still see that it's, you know, above that line would be going from negative infinity up to the negative two. And on the other side, sorry, negative square root of two. And then on the other side from the square root of two to positive infinity. That would be my answer. So in this box right here, I'm going to type negative infinity up to the negative square root of two. Now it does have an equal to on it, right? So I need a bracket. And then union bracket square root of two to infinity on the other side. That's my answer. All right, I got one more problem. It's a word problem. So we have to apply this to an actual word problem. So it makes, you know, real sense in the real world. <clears throat> All right, here it is. A ball is thrown vertically upward with an initial velocity of 32 feet per second the distance s in feet of the ball from the ground after t seconds is s which is the height of the ball can be calculated by taking 32 times time however many seconds it is minus 16 t squared so you know if i wanted to know how high the ball was at one second i'd plug in one 32 times one minus 16 times one, it'd be at 16 feet off the ground. But what they wanna know is part A, at what time will the ball strike the ground? All right, so it's thrown up in the air, it's coming back down. We wanna know right here when it hits the ground. When you hit the ground, what's your height? Zero. I throw the ball up in the air, it comes back down. Once it hits the ground, it's zero feet off the ground. So I'm going to stick that zero right here. So zero equals 32t minus 16t squared. And solving for t, I'm going to factor out a greatest common factor. There's only two terms here. It's not a difference of two squares, so greatest common factoring is all I can do. I'm going to pull out a 16t. That'll leave me with a 2 minus a t, right? 16t times 2 is 32t. 16t times t is the 16t squared. Okay, so now my two possible answers are either the 16t equals zero, which means t would just have to be a zero, or the two minus t is zero, which means this t right here would have to be a two. Time equal to zero makes no sense. Actually, that's the starting point. That's when you throw the ball. The, the time you let the ball go, that is t is equal to zero we're looking for where it lands on the ground. So T is equal to two would be the correct answer. So two goes in there. <clears throat> but then part B says, um, 
for what time t is the ball more than 12 feet above the ground? Okay, so this is similar to that last one where it wanted us to take f of x greater than one. They want to say, for what time t is the ball more than 12? More than 12, wouldn't that be greater than 12? So I have to, this is part B over here, I have to, to still take the 32t minus 16t squared because that is how I calculate height based on t and I have to make that greater than 12. Okay, well, I'm gonna set this equal to zero. So I'm gonna subtract 12 on both sides. Okay, so now I have greater than zero. On the other side, minus 12 cannot be subtracted from either of those two terms I have in pink, because there's not like terms. And in order to factor this, I need to put it in descending order. So I need to put the minus 16t squared first, the plus 32 second, sorry, 32t second, and then that minus 12 right here is just, you know, on the end. Now, I'm running out of room, so I'm gonna add another slide here. <clears throat> I have to either factor this or use the quadratic formula. Um, if you use the quadratic formula, that's cool, or you can factor it. Um, the only problem with the factoring or the quadratic formula is it is easier to do both when your a is positive. My a is at negative 16. And I would try to simplify this anyway, because 16 and 32 and 12 are big ass numbers as far as factoring or quadratic formula. So I'm gonna divide everybody, including the zero, because what you do to one side, you gotta do the other by, let's see, 16 goes into 32, but it doesn't go into 12, and 12 doesn't go into 32. Four is my biggest number. So a negative four. That's gonna give me here a positive four t squared. Here, a negative eight t here a positive three, and this is still zero, whoopsie-daisy, but I divided by a negative four. When you divide by a negative, you have to reverse your sign. If you divide by a negative, reverse your sign. And then I'm going to factor, I'm going to use that AC method again, just to go back over that. Um, for the AC method, I would take the four times the three, four times three equals 12. So it's either one times 12, two times six, or three times four. I have to pick the pair that I can replace a negative eight with. And that would be negative two and negative six. Negative two times negative six gives me this positive 12, but they add up to the negative eight. So first term is still first term, last term is still last term, but then I'm gonna have a negative two T and a minus six T replacing the negative 8t. 
so that I can now factor by grouping. So uh, the first two I can pull out of two and a T. And when I do that, I am left with a 2t minus 1. From these two, since it starts with a negative 6, I need to pull out a negative. Let's see, 6 and 3, I can pull out just a 3. <clears throat> and when I do, I'm left with another 2t minus 1. So my two factors are the matching 2t minus 1. And then you take the green 2t and the green minus 3, and they come together and become their own factor. And now these two t's are going to be where it crosses the x-axis, because I have set this thing greater than, well, now it's less than 0. I am going to add another slide. Okay, so at this point I had the 2t minus 3 and this was the 2t minus 1. All right, so either this 2t minus 1 equals 0, which means t would have to be add 1 divide by 2, so 1 half. And this one would be, you'd have to add 3 and then divide by 2, so 3 halves. Okay. So the picture that they had, actually... Yeah, I'll just draw it again. Um, <clears throat> they had the ball being thrown somewhere from here up and over, right? And we were looking at where the ball was. Whoops, sorry, went back too far. Okay, um, more than 12 feet off the ground. Okay, that was their picture, all right. So they were showing that this right here, this right here was 12 feet. So the ball goes up and comes back down. And at two spots, it's at 12 feet. Those two spots happen at one half and three halves. They're above, above right here. So my final answer is, and it wasn't an equal to, so it's from, oh wait, if I go back to their little thing, how did they have it? Yeah, they already had the less than signs for you. They're doing it like in set builder notation. So you would put the one half here is less than T is less than three halves. So between a half a second and one and a half seconds, that ball will be more than 12 feet above the ground. And I just, oh, I'm two minutes over, sorry. All right, I'm done. Does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. If not, hi, have fun. The homework's been assigned, so have fun with that. Thank you. You're welcome. I see somebody did a chat down here. What was it? Oh, I had a nope. Okay. Thank you. Bye.